take a little sidebar since I've mentioned music, because um, I, I, I did an interview once about this topic, what surgeons listen to in the OR. Do you listen to music in the OR while you're? I listen to a lot of music. Okay, any particular kind? Or? Um, on any given day in the operating room, you'll find uh, that I will probably be listening to a very wide range and eclectic mix of music. What do I mean by that? I mean, there are times when I listen to classical, I listen to jazz, I listen to somewhat avant-garde music sometimes, um, but I do listen to a lot of pop and folk and things like that as well. But my main goal is, you know, I, I don't want anybody uncomfortable in the room. I want there to be a sort of a lightness to the atmosphere, uh, a movement, so I don't want it to be too dragged down. So sometimes certain classical pieces can make people feel a little sleepy, so we avoid yes. that. Mm -hmm. um, jazz is a nice choice sometimes because it can be lively and there's a beat and also, you know, can keep things moving. Um, it's important to read the room a little bit sometimes. Um, the people who I consider uh, very much to, to kind of guide what playlist I'm going to play um, is actually my scrub tech. So some scrub techs that I work with, if they're younger, if I know what kind of music they like, that's what I'll be playing for them. Others who are maybe older, different backgrounds, jazz, right? So the reason I focus a little bit more on that person is because they're also in a rhythm with me. That person is dancing with me, essentially, right? To the point where I want to be able to hold out my hand and have the right instrument go in there without me saying a word, right? So that person has to be into the rhythm and cadence of the surgery. They have to know what they're doing. So I try to provide that person with just enough stimulation to keep them alert, right? Mm -hmm. Not distracted. And Dr. Bose, uh, pancreatic cancer is a particularly difficult cancer to treat as it's often discovered only after it's spread. Um, is there any efforts underway to discover it sooner? So um, this is a question I get asked very often because, um, because pancreas cancer is, as you mentioned, tough to treat. And you know, unfortunately, still most people who get pancreatic cancer will die of the disease. So the stakes are high for those who get it. Um, and the theory would suggest that if we had some screening tool uh, to catch tumors at an earlier stage, that we would be able to improve the survival of pancreatic cancer. And that theory is borne out when we think about, for example, breast cancer. When screening, mammography, and things like that are done, we know that we can probably pick up tumors when they're smaller, uh, and survival has increased for patients with breast cancer over the past 50 years, for example. When in the 70s, some people got breast cancer, the survival was the same as pancreatic cancer is today, dismal. Uh, and that has changed dramatically within a lifetime. So our hope is that certainly we can find some screening method. Screening methods for cancers in general uh, today, under our sort of major pushes, um, are coming in the form of trying to detect DNA, specifically mutated DNA. And that's being done in several forms. We've known now for some time that in most organs that develop these what we call solid tumors, right? We're not talking about leukemias or things like that. We're talking about breast cancer, colon cancer, gastric cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, liver cancers, most solid tumors. They actually do start circulating cancer cells in the bloodstream relatively early on. So while size of a tumor is a good marker for how long maybe it's been there, there's no size cutoff beyond which suddenly that cancer starts to engage in the process of spreading. Once a cancer sort of develops, we know now that some of those cells start to move. 
our body's immune system generally takes care of individual cells here and there that it recognizes as problematic. But then it becomes a numbers game. So the size of it, why people with cancers that are bigger have, have a more likelihood of having spread of disease is just that that marker is of time. How long have cancer cells been circulating and how long has that numbers game been occurring where the army that is your immune system has been fighting the army of cancer cells washing throughout it, right? So eventually some of those cancer cells are gonna be able to set up shop somewhere. So to take a step back, when we think about screening, what we want is a test that's cheap, easy, affordable, and we can give to everybody that has a high ability to detect the presence of a tumor, and we call that sensitivity, so a highly sensitive test. We also want it to be highly specific, so we don't want to have a lot of false results with it, right? We want it to be able to say that if, my, if this test is negative, you really probably don't have anything going on, right? That's a little different than saying if this test is positive, there's a high likelihood that you have something going on. Both statements seem like the same thing, but they're not. One is sensitivity, one is specificity. We don't have that for pancreas cancer. For patients who have a high risk of pancreatic cancer, and that includes patients with familial pancreatic cancer, multiple members of their family having pancreatic cancer, we recommend genetic screening as well as potentially imaging surveillance. So imaging for patients with familial pancreatic cancer is now part of a consensus guideline. The other group of patients who we're actually finding now more and more with genetic testing is for patients who harbor genes that may predispose them to pancreatic cancer mutations in genes that predispose them. So those are mutations in genes like BRCA1 and 2, PALB2, ATM. These are, you know, these are just a alphabet soup, but a lot of these we found because families with familial pancreatic cancer bear mutations in these genes. They also share, in the sense, these mutations with folks who have a series of other types of cancers and who are at higher risk for those other cancers. I mentioned BRCA. So patients who are at high risk for breast cancer and ovarian cancer because of BRCA mutation may be at high risk for pancreatic cancer as well. And so similarly, we're finding patients who are finding mutations for other reasons, breast cancer being one of them. So we're screening those patients by imaging to try and catch something early if we're going to have a problem with the pancreas. Dr. Bose, thank you for your time and your candor. I'm hoping our viewers enjoy this chance to hear your stories and learn something about a pretty important topic when we're talking about cancer diagnosis and treatment. And thank you for watching. On behalf of myself, our guests, the Mercy staff, and the Sisters of Mercy, we wish you good health and humor. And until we meet again, May the road rise up to meet you. Now it's time for, wait, doctor, I forgot to ask. Dr. Bose, what is that question that people that you see may often forget to ask that you really wish they wouldn't, that you want them to ask you? Well, we try to cover things pretty completely. Um, having done this for a while now, uh, if a patient is not asking, I will provide a lot more information sometimes that they didn't think to ask anyway. I often get asked, uh, what should I eat, right? And here we are doing surgery on the GI tract, so what should I eat? How do I optimize? Um, and I think that's one of those questions that I, I wish more people would ask. Many people do ask it, but I wish more people would ask outright 
um, and sometimes, unfortunately, I don't necessarily address it in full. But it, if I if I might jump on the soapbox a little bit, what we really want patients to do when they're preparing for surgery is to stay active as much as they can and to maximize their protein intake and to minimize their intake of refined sugars. So what do I mean by that? I mean shop around the edges of the grocery store, right? All the stuff in boxes, cans, and bags, leave it alone. Right? What I want you to do is get lots of vitamins from fresh fruit and vegetables. I want you to get good, lean proteins. Uh, dairy is fine. Cheese is fine. A bit of fat is fine. Right? This kind of dietary preparation for going into surgery really seeks to lower your carb load and increase your protein intake, partly because your glucose control oftentimes impacts how you heal. Second, after surgery, you're going to not eat very well for any kind of GI surgery, whether you're having colon surgery, bowel surgery, pancreas, gastric, whatever. You're going to go into some calorie deficit, right, in some form for a while. Where it hurts the most is your protein levels, right? What happens when you go into a healing state is your body goes into what's called a catabolic state. It starts to kind of take protein from your muscles to heal, which is why your muscles get weak, which is why in order to prepare for surgery, you think of it as a sporting event or an athletic event. You have to train to it. You have to exercise so that you maintain muscle mass or even build a little bit of muscle mass because you're going to lose it afterwards, right? And then you have to work hard to get it back at, during your recovery, which means I want you walking as soon as possible. I want you moving around. I want you to get out of bed, right? So those things are important. 